Are you on the RCR mailing list? Never miss a beat of the news and hard-hitting stories you've come to know and love. Stay in the loop. Visit realitycheck.radio forward slash email. Now it's time for Cam's Buddies. This week we'll find out what they think about the sacking of the Health New Zealand Board and the gross overspending that's been going on in that particular area of health. My producer has them all lined up and ready to go. Let's go now to Cam's Morning Buddies. Good morning and welcome to Cam's Buddies in the morning this time, Miles. Good morning, Cam. How are you? I'm Box of Birds. Box of Birds. Excellent. Excellent. I've got a tricky one for you. Everyone else is talking about US politics. I thought we'd talk about the debacle in the health system in New Zealand and the government on Monday sacking the Health New Zealand Board, or otherwise known as Te Patu Ora, um, because they're exceeding their budget by $130 million a month and are staring down the barrel of a deficit for the financial year of $1.3 billion. What are your thoughts on that? How excited am I that finally someone takes a stand and sacks the uh, responsible um, people. And isn't it great that finally some responsibility gets sheeted home? And I'm, I'm very happy that this is the case, and I'm very happy that the government has done it. My um, true feelings are that there's a few other boards that need to have um, the same treatment. They need to be sacked outright as well. But uh, let's return to health. What an indictment that the whole board has been sacked. It just goes to show how far the um, appointments made by the Ardern government went. And clearly, it was the wrong way up a one-way street, and it just ended in everyone falling off a cliff. It's appalling. It's just appalling. You know, you've got um, Hipkins coming out and, and Aisha Verrill, you know, obviously having designs on the leadership. Um, she's busily telling everyone around Wellington she's going to be the next uh, leader of the Labour Party. But they're all come out and said, oh, this is appalling. We need to put more money into health. Um, th- there's actually a shortage, uh, all these sorts of things. And and Shane Reeti's pointed out, well, actually since 2018, there's been 2,500 more people who have been hired in the health system, not as doctors, not as nurses, not as specialists, not in any way, shape or form at the front line. No, these are middle managers and bureaucrats who are sitting in a swanky office somewhere. Woohoo! Let's take the knife to them because... By crikey, I'll tell you something for free. Health is just a boil on the bottom of the economy. And if we haven't got competent people in charge of those billions of dollars, how the hell are they going to be spent effectively? And, um, you know, I get a little bit worked up um, with health. My um, father's been through the system, and I cannot see how... I cannot see how adding layers of middle management helps performance at the sharp end with the heart problems, the, the hip problems, that even the general accidents that the health system is supposed to look after. It doesn't. And this board, actually, I feel very strongly that they should be criminally liable for their profligate waste of money. It's almost misfeasance. I see the doctor, one of the doctors' unions has come out and said, oh, we need more money spent on the front line. And, you know, the, there's not enough money being spent in the health system. And on the surface, I agree with her, right? Because if you get rid of that 2,500 bureaucrats who no doubt are on ex- in excess of $100,000 or more, um, then you should be able to pay doctors and nurses uh, to fill those positions. Um, so it seems a bit well, ass backwards, to be perfectly front, frank, that the government who merged, or well, this was the Labour Party, merged all of these uh, area health boards in the middle of a pandemic, I might add, on the basis that 
if it's centralised, it'll be better. And it clearly hasn't been. Yeah. Yeah. And the if it's centralised, it'll be better mantra has been repeated by the Ardern government over quite a few sectors. And it has just been a an absolute disaster. And the um, waste of money that was three, five, seven waters is eye-watering, to, <laughs> to oh, say the you- least. Then and the waste of money. I mean, you take the um, just, politics, what do they call it? What is it? Teepooking or something like that with all these flash new cars all sign written driving around, but actually the politics are all going broke because it's not being managed properly. Yeah. So here here we have the ex- absolute myth of centralisation. What it means is it means there's about to be a profligate waste of money. And we've seen that in Auckland with the super city. It's it's just repeated endlessly. And our politicians, especially the Labour politicians, who think that everything centralised and controlled is better, they'll never learn. And we will see in a few short years it all centralised again. And, you know, it'll be just this never-ending cycle. But I'll tell you this for free. If the board members were made criminally liable for their mistakes, there would be a huge shift in the competency and a huge shift in their um, responsibility and getting it right. And, you know, that's why I say that it is almost malfeasance. I agree with you. Well, let's hope uh, this is the start of the government actually grasping the nettle and starting to take an axe to non-essential services and get things back under control. And uh, thank you for... They have to clean house. They have to clean house. Thank you, Miles, for giving us a call in the morning. I know it's been a little bit uh, tougher, uh, but then we had to fill in for Paul Brennan while he moves to Queenstown. Okay. Good on, Paul. Thanks for your call. Cheers. Bye. Good morning, Lindley. Welcome to Cam's Buddies at breakfast. (laughs) Oh, well... If you want to be be up at my time of the morning, um, I'd feel sorry for you. I've been out for a run, 4.20 a.m. this morning. (laughs) And, um, pardon? Good on you. Yep, and I had breakfast long ago. (laughs) Well, you know, I I normally am going for a walk at this time of the morning, but, um, you know, needs must. Here we are online and uh, broadcasting the crunch at breakfast. So we've got buddies at breakfast. It sounds very alliterative, doesn't it? Oh, I think it's outstanding, you know. I mean, if I could get my phone outside, I'd get the burn, birds to celebrate. <laughs> so, Lindley, uh, you would have seen on Monday the Health Minister, Shane Reedy, uh sacked the Health New Zealand Board. Um, apparently, Health New Zealand has been overspending to the tune of uh, millions of dollars a month and uh, project have a blowout in their budget of $1.3 billion at the end of the financial year. Thoughts on that? Yes, well, we we actually discussed uh, a little bit of this sort of stuff um, earlier, didn't we, in, in, earlier in the year, but hmm. far from me to understand the processes and even the people overseeing a health system because it all changes quicker than I can blink. And, and on top of that, it would require me a week to find the statistics that I require for this chat as well. And um, I'm not really totally up with the play, you know, from from the ins and outs of all of this, but um, I am in the human chain of using healthcare, so I can sort of come from that point, really. To me... Um, the, the problem is obviously around gross overspending, mm. and I do actually commend them for trying to do something or start to do something because absolutely bizarre what's been going on. But to my simplistic mind, the causes of <clears throat> overspending has not been addressed or even known, and they have actually said that. Um, they don't know what's going on financially at all. But what about a few obvious um Ones, what it causes. What about increased immigration? In a decade, net, net immigration has shot up from 58 
thousand to one hundred and twenty six so that's more than double um, Have we got double the infrastructure to match that? No, we haven't, and the rule should be infrastructure first and immigration second, but it does seem to me that in government spending that never happens it's always the opposite and another disastrous example of buy now, pay later is um, going on with this practice. They just add it all the time and then they borrow money, then they borrow money to pay the interest and it goes on and on and on. Um, the bureaucracy has snowballed, so they say. There's two thousand five hundred staff. 2,500 2, staff in the back office since 2018. Just ridiculous. They're spending and, $130 million a month over budget. Now, either the budget's wrong or they ha are just uh, wasting money uh, with gay abandon. Well, I think it's the latter, you know, because we've had constant changes of names and protocols and all that stuff. That costs a lot of money to keep doing that. And the two health systems that we had, you know, what about that? I mean, that must have cost an absolute fortune in extra staff and bureaucrats to run that and probably for no result whatsoever. Well, when and, they changed it to Te Whato Ora, um, every staff member would have got a new name badge and that would have been hmm. not nothing. You know, that would have been a significant cost just on stupid name badges. I, I don't That would be huge. And what... What about the frivolous waste of money on online services? And we talked about this another time. Um, for example, Health New Zealand putting on its website an extensive article that would have cost money to do on uh, dementia and picking your nose. And they've got step-by-step -step instructions on um, how to avoid the dangers of picking your nose, step-by-step um, on how to stop the habit. And then we find out it was never researched on humans anyway, just mice. Now, do mice pick their noses, and is that relative to humans? And what did it cost for this sort of rubbish? Who was the researcher who had to sit there and pick mice, mice nose, mice, mice's nose? Well, <laughs> yes. It's, a, it's just unbelievable that anybody would actually press buttons to put that on their website, but that's Health New Zealand as it was. Well, Health New Zealand also had instructions on to all their staff on how you could improve your day by having um, uh, uh, starting every meeting with a karakia. Now, if you said, uh, if you were in the boss of Health New Zealand and said, look, I'm a Christian now or a Muslim or, or Jewish or anything else other than Maori, and you said, we want to start each day with a prayer, there would be an outrage. But because you say it's a karakia, there's not an outrage, but now you've got, you know, thousands of minutes a week being wasted on karakia and, and stupidity like that, which isn't helping people's health at all. No, well, I think they probably should have been doing some Christian uh, prayers. Um Thank you for for thank you, Lord, for for what I'm about to receive because I think that's what it's all about. It's about getting money. Yeah, you're exactly right. Because what do all of the media go to? They go to, go to all these health lobbyists. Uh, they don't call them lobbyists; they so call them health experts. But in 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 reality, they're actually lobbying to have a, a bigger trough every single time. They're never looking at where the money is being spent, is it being spent appropriately? You've got endless uh, amounts of research, uh, particularly in health, that is all about te ao Māori, um, that's being funded uh, in a separate budget altogether, but um, largely that's where the, re the research that mentions te ao Māori gets funded and re you know research into, I don't know, lung cancer or uh, any sort of other cancers is scrabbling for money. Um, because um, unless they, you know, make it match uh, some Maori overview or Maori perspective, uh, it doesn't get funded. Well, it's always been my argument for all these um, fundraising days going right back before they had two separate races in the system, um, raising millions of dollars to um, help people with cancer, and I do feel very sorry for them. 
but there's never um, any funding drives for research into cancer as long as I can remember. And that actually applies to overall health because this is getting right, right into the cause of what the problem is. What's being done to improve health rather than treat disease? And unfortunately, Cam, there are trillions to be made out of sick people. And for every medication or medical equipment purchase, there's a profit for somebody else. And the pharmaceutical industry is dependent on those sick people. And this is my solution. Until we address that, things will never change. And let's cancel sex gender education in primary schools and put health and lifestyle education in its place. It's an interesting point you make there about uh, medications that people are prescribed. They clearly don't work because they don't make you better. You have to keep taking them. You know, they're, all they're I doing know. is treating symptoms rather than act the actual illness or the disease. And so they say, oh, well, we need these drugs, and you've got to keep taking those drugs at vast expense, but they're actually not solving the problem and that's where no, well, they, they, do, they don't want them they don't want it to solve the problem because look if you went round and um i mean you've had talks on there with your hair studies and the rest of it um and i think both of you and i've got a pretty good understanding of health but if you got your health absolutely optimal how many patients would there be well there'd be plenty of capacity for acute cases then wouldn't there There'd be plenty of capacity for them. Um, and then, because there's been some very sad cases, you know, in the last, well, only the last couple of weeks, in fact, some very tragic cases where um, diag diagnosis and everything were, were totally neglected and de deaths were the result of that. So it shouldn't happen. And, and you see, I can remember a time when it didn't happen. I can remember um, people would come into A&E and immediately get look, looked at and um, fixed up and, you know, treated accordingly. But if you go into an A&E now, it's just crawling with people. Well, it's they're crawling. often they're often there because they can't afford the GP fees, so they're going there for things that, pe you know, you and I would go to a general practitioner for. Uh, they're, but they're tipping up to the hospital and trying to get treated for, uh, you know, things that shouldn't be treated at a hospital. Hospitals, in my view, should be for acute or specialist care. Yeah, well, I guess, um, I mean, I absolutely agree with you there, but what what do people do when they ring up their, their GP and they can't get in for, for about six weeks, you know? And I think there's a small percentage of people have cottoned on that if they ring the ambulance, they get a... Uh, well, they usually have to pay for the ambulance, but they'll get immediate and free care, you know, in A&E, whereas if they have to get the GP, well, first and foremost, some of them have got to wait weeks, and then they've got to pay a consultancy fee um, on top of that. I think a few have twigged to that, but when I helped somebody in A&E, you know, that's not what I saw. What I saw was people everywhere, and they were coming in. There was a queue with St John uh, people pushing another trolley in with a woeful person on it, you know, one after the other. Well, I remember... And right this... I remember when I right had... Right When I had... Uh, um, uh, not pleurisy... Um, Oh, I've forgotten now anyway. Um, I ended up in hospital, got taken there by an ambulance, and for four hours I was in corridor space two at Middlemore Hospital. Mm, even I know, that's commonplace, Cam. Yeah. So um, anyway, I, I do um, applaud the government for at least having a look at this um, and putting the hot knife through the uh, butter with the staff. I think that's quite a good start. I mean, if you don't look at a problem, you're never going to solve it, are you? Well, that's right. You know, and and I'm a firm believer in all of these things, whether it's in business or in government, that what gets measured gets done. And, you know, when the last mm. national government was in, they had targets for people to be seen in emergency departments. Well, when Labor got in, they 
they ditched all of those targets. They ditched all the waiting list right. targets. They they ditched all of the things that were measuring performance and the health system blew out because what get gets measured gets done and they weren't measuring anything, so nothing got done. No, well apparently none of them know, you know, what the figures are around all that sort of thing. Um which is why they have uh, sacked the board, isn't it? Well, I mean, that's the thing. Um, they, you know, the Labor government announced one point nine billion dollars for mental health, and everyone in the mental health um, system is saying, "Well, where's the money?" It was a, that, just, yeah, that's right, and that goes for a lot of other outfits too that thought they were getting money, and they never see it. You know, it's a ticket clipping uh, spree, really. It's just changed so much, but I do think, you know, the major thing that has to be addressed, um, and not by sugar taxes and things like that, we need to educate the younger peoples on health health and lifestyle and get them to start thinking because, um, you know, when I run along the road, there's uh, cans and cans of uh, soda pop and stuff and energy drinks and all that thrown on the road, uh, Kentucky Fry cartons, you know. But a sugar tax won't work. I mean, Boyd Swinburne constantly goes on about needing to have a sugar tax and a and a tax on tobacco and a tax on this and a tax, tax, tax. He hasn't found a tax he doesn't like. And he's always putting out press releases talking about we need to have a tax on this. Well, they did a sugar tax in Mexico and it failed because people just, you know, let's say you have a five cent tax on a bottle of Coke. So now your bottle of Coke, instead of being $3.50, $3.55, is it going to stop you drinking Coke? No, it's not. Well, it won't stop me because I've never started. No, but, you know, um, they're saying that a tax will stop young people um, from from drinking these drinks or having age restrictions. Well, how's that gone for smoking? That didn't work either. If you tell somebody you can't have something, guess what? They want it. Oh, well, I think it would work even less with um, soft drinks and stuff like that because they've got absolutely into the habit of it, you know. And it's not sugar. Um, Everyone, or not everyone, but a lot of uh, online gurus are saying sugar is poison and all this. But, you know, um, we we were raised, uh, we had cereal and sugar, you know, on our breakfast and we had cordial that's got sugar in it and stuff like that. Never did us any harm at all. I've got beautiful teeth and, uh, you know, no no tooth decay. We were running around and burning off those calories and our parents made sure we brushed our teeth before we went to school and when we got home after dinner. You know, that's that's well trained people to do things that are beneficial for them health-wise. That's absolutely the truth and that's why they, they should get rid of that sex gender tripe and uh, put put some lifestyle education in there. Yeah, that would make a difference, a significant difference. It would take a wee while to sort of take root, but it would make a hell of a difference. And it would also stop um, all these fad diets, you know. We've sort of gone in a circle with them as if they're a solution to things, and they're not. It's your overall lifestyle is what counts. Absolutely. All right, that's all we've got time for today, Leslie. Thank you for your contribution, and we'll talk again next week, but it'll be in the afternoon next week. (laughs) Okay, Cam. See you later. Okay. Bye-bye. Good morning. Welcome to Cam's Buddies at Breakfast, Paul. How are you? Very good, thank you, Cam, and good morning to you. You might have seen the news on Monday. The government sacked the Health New Zealand Board uh, and appointed a commissioner. And the reason for that is the diabolical financial status of Health New Zealand, where they are exceeding their budget by approximately $130 million a month and are staring down the barrel of a $1.4 billion uh, deficit at the end of the financial year. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I don't think that's too good for anybody. I think that Christopher Luxon said that they were getting 16.2 Seven billion more on a thirty billion total, and so um, when you see that that's the sort of thing that they're spending, and I've just had a friend who um, had his missus in hospital recently, and there was sort of only one nurse on, and they were saying, "What's the story with where are all the rest of the nurses?" You know, one nurse was looking after twenty-three patients or something, 
and she was saying, oh, there, there wasn't enough money for them. And um, then I heard um, Luxon say that there was 14 layers of management between uh, number one and the rank and file staff. And two and a half thousand more bureaucrats in the health system, not nurses, not doctors, not specialists, bureaucrats since 2018 for no demonstrable improvement in service. Yeah, I, I see that the guy that I've put on there is Lester Levy, and um, he, I think, has done quite a number of things. I think he was um, part and parcel of doing the council amalgamation. And so I think whatever jobs he gets given to do, he can do it, providing the scope is there and correct. But um, with a name like um, Levy, I know he sounds like he's a Jew. I think he's a South African, but that Levy is definitely from Jewish origin. One would hope that he's um, he's got the ability to work out where the money should be going and how much and, and one thing or another. But I also heard him say he's got to have a lot of dealings with the unions and all those sorts of things. And when they say they sacked the board, I think most of them had resigned because of either things weren't going their way or whatever. So sacking the board sounds like quite an amazing thing that they think that they've done. But I think there was only one left, and that was... Um, I think there was Roger Gerald, and, and I'm not even sure that when I see some of the things he was talking about, he seemed like a pretty woke sort of an individual. So who knows how it's going to go, but um, I think Shane Ritchie's on the right track. If people are spending a lot of money and putting layers and layers on top and, and you know, with the amalgamation of the hospitals so that there was a board of health for New Zealand... But all I did was put everybody that was under the district health boards are still there. They just put another layer of management on top of them. Well, that didn't seem like quite the answer. And, and give, gave them all new new name tags at probably some exorbitant amount. Yes. And I also think um, when you name things with silly names, you, you get the silly name syndrome. Yeah. And, and, and they've got names that I don't understand. Like, or what does that mean? What does that mean to the most people? So in the end, I think what you need to do is say, what, are you, what is it that you do? And if you're the health board, well, then you're the health board. And if you're the health commissioner, then you're the health commissioner. If you're going to sort the stuff out, then sort the stuff out. Mm. So um, I think he's um, an engineer, and he's got a few, few other characteristics in his bag of tricks, even though they call him a doctor. I don't know if he's a medical doctor or if he's a doctor of... Um, of engineering, but um, he strikes me as he's starting to talk media talk so he can actually engage with the media about what he's intending to do so that they don't automatically try and blow him up on his first week. Although I think he's been, he was the chairman before, if I remember, but he was appointed in March or sometime. And um, I think um, yeah. Luxon said he had put, put in an observer into the health board so that he was on the board watching what was happening. And after a few months of seeing things go crazy and then being told that there was a um, $130 million a month going west of the budget, which was already the thick end of $30 billion, mm. well, you sort of think, I mean, in, in a billion and $30 billion is only 3% as a problem, but it's still a problem when you're getting less for more. He is a medical doctor. Um, he's qualified as a Bachelor of Medicine and also a Bachelor of Surgery, so he's a cutter as well as as a as a normal okay. doctor. Okay, but he's right. He, I mean, he's the chairman of a major consult in engineering environmental consultancy firm. He's done some really big jobs. Um, he he was a chair of a district health board, so he's got a handle on how it works inside the health system. He uh, was then the chair of the Auckland District Health Board, so. He's got his chops in professional ability to do the job, and he has a track record of succeeding in, at what he does. So it's early days yet, but let's hope he gets a good handle on this and, and starts to turn the health system into something that um, that it was imagined that it would be with this amalgamation. I mean, that's the stupid thing about it. Andrew yeah. Little is the health minister. In the middle of a pandemic, he dreams up this idea of getting rid of all the health boards, uh, setting up this massive bureaucracy all in the middle of a pandemic and giving it a Maori name because that'll work. Exactly. 
And um, now I think that they're trying to, at, at the very least, he's been able to have three or four other commissioners so that they could be um, doing it somewhat more local because there's nothing like people in the area knowing what they need. And I, I see that Shane Betty has also um, said that's the end of the Maori Health Board having a second tier of something else. And they're all moaning their guts out about that as well. But I'm thinking it wasn't a wise thing to start with, having such a racist department that depending on your race, what you get. And then I see that they're talking about also in that, that um, when when asked, what have you guys achieved? What the, the two major achievements that they said they'd done were able to stay being going under the way things already worked. So I'm thinking, well, they didn't achieve anything really that wasn't able to continue under any other system. So um, I think well, that, they managed the decline in the health system. <laughs> yes, they, they, they're able to manage it. And, and they're saying, oh, the um, a Maori's life expectancy, if you're a Maori male or female, is seven or eight years less than if you're a European. And I've always thought it's quite interesting that they never talk about what it was before colonial, colonialism came to town. And I think then it was you know, 30 years difference. So as we the gap is narrowed to seven years, and seven years is still not good, um, a lot of folk have to be a bit responsible for their own way of life, their own... Because I think when, when you've got these things that are health boards that are for the sick, it would be good if they could actually put the, uh, the fence at the top and make... Here's some ideas to keep you healthy rather than here's some ideas to help fix you when you cook. Well, and that's what I was talking about with Lindley um, before you. I said the problem with the health system and, and the way that it's designed, it's designed with a safety net at the bottom that's you know not rigged properly anyway and some people fall through or, or crash into the rocks. And we're, we're not actually fixing people. What we're doing is we're treating symptoms and giving them drugs. And you would think that if you took the drugs for a short amount of time that it would fix the problem. But, oh, no, you've got to keep taking those drugs for life. So they're not actually fixing anything uh, about a person's underlying health. Uh, we're actually just treating symptoms and Band-Aid over it, and the costs go up and up and up because we've got an increasing population, which means we're going to have more of these things happening and uh, more of those drugs being prescribed. And the only people winning out of this are the pharmaceutical companies, and we know how much we can trust them. Exactly. And I see um, they're also calling for the resignation of David Seymour because he was saying that Pharmac shouldn't be considering the Treaty of Waitangi as its underlying principle when negotiating prices with drug companies. And they're saying, oh, what a terrible thing for him to say, but... What business does the treaty have in a negotiation over drugs and money? I mean, what they, they had a, a number of staff doing that, that he was saying, well, we're trying to get the best amount of drugs available for the most m number of sicknesses that the people have that can do the best result. It's a negotiation in that regard. And having a portion of the department settling for making sure that they're in line with the treaty didn't seem to help. Um, they did nothing in order to make drugs more accessible for the average New Zealander. So I'm thinking, well, he should be commended, not asked uh, could he hand his hat in. Well, the people who are making those complaints are also the same ones who talk about Maori science and Maori health and how we'd all be better off if we followed that. So why the hell are they concerned about negotiations with a drug company? Interesting point you raise. And also... Um, when, when you look at, um, if we could get people less likely to be sick, mm. um, as you say, symptom fixing isn't where it's at. Like if my car's got an engine that's overheating and I can see on a temperature gauge, if I cut the temperature gauge wire, it'll go down to cold. The engine won't change. So if you haven't fixed the, the underlying problem, and, and in the old days, and I know it's lots of old people you think you're stupid old fool when they say that, <laughs> but they used to do more exercise, they would have more sunshine on the person, they'd breathe fresh air, and there's a whole lot of things that you can do that make you a much healthier person. Um, and so the, the, if you're looking at wellness medicine, they'd do a whole lot better than sickness medicine is my view. I think you've I think you've hit the nail on the head there, and that is the problem. We're, we're treating 
symptoms. Uh, we're not actually treating the underlying illnesses. And if we fix the underlying illnesses, then they won't need any more treatment. Oh, hang on. That breaks the business model for pharmaceutical com companies. Yeah, I know, um, I know this um, um, young health professional um, woman who um, does contact care. I don't know how many of your listeners have heard of contact care. I have. But I know that. Right. I know you have. But she does this stuff where she's fixing a whole lot of things which are preventative. And it's like um, there was a bureau on one of the movies I watched, a bureau of people who were going to commit crimes in the future, and they would arrest them knowing that they were going to commit crimes in the future, and everyone was saying how unfair it was. Well, some of these things that this physician does is she stopped you from getting an illness that you were about to get because of the different things that were obvious to her, but not necessarily you, that were about to go wrong with you. And and I look and I think she's got the idea really well of what she's doing, um, and she's saving a lot of people a lot of heartache and a lot of trouble, but it's often with little thanks because, and, and if any of you listeners look up um, contact care, there's a whole lot um, of things there that can really make a lot of difference to people who don't need drugs necessarily, who don't need vaccines necessarily. I mean, I'm not saying these things are, are not the right answer. I'm just saying there's a whole lot of things that can happen with a more holistic health view. Oh, I, I absolutely agree with you on that. I mean, I, I've used contact care um, significantly to you know fix a couple of things that doctors had given up on um, with me, like keeping my potassium under control. Well, that's sorted now. And it wasn't done through doctors. It was done through contact care. And um, people like Gary Moller and, you know, uh, a few other different kinds of treatment. I, I look at alternative treatments and I think there's something there that we're missing. And uh, so I, I make sure that I am up with the play on those sorts of things. And, and I, my health's a whole lot better as a result. I mean to that because um, these, these are good things that if you're working on keeping yourself well, and I know – we're away from talking about the $30 billion and the $130 million, um, blowout. But I think Shane's done the right thing. I heard um, Hosking talking to the Prime Minister on it, and I thought he was being a bit tough, saying, why didn't you fix it on day one when he, when he, when he arrived? And there's a lot of things you can fix on day one. But I think by getting a government advisor on the board to watch it like a, a sort of a monitor, and getting a report and then acting on the report, I think that um, even though it's taken six months, I think that's about as timely as you could have done this because I think that's a pretty big thing to um, appoint a commissioner. That's sort of what is it? they say that's the strongest power that the government has in any of its government department type things to do. So that's taking about as strong an action as it's possible to take. So I think we could wait and see some great results come out of the health sector or at least some good results. Well, we should also look at some successes overseas. If you take countries like Switzerland and India, where something like 65% or higher in, in those countries of people are treated with homeopathy first and only uh, traditional um, medicinal solutions after, uh, you know, they, they've got a... a you know, greater outcomes of success that are happening. And again, it's that preventative thing. So if you look at things like contact care, homeopathy and uh, naturopathy, um, I think there's some insights there that we could learn and integrate into the health system as well. Absolutely. I think that's very true. I've been to a, um, a homeopath um, not, not too long ago, actually, and the things that I was needing worked on, um, it, it seemed like, again, I couldn't get my head around how the, the most diluted substance of anything could actually make a, a blind bit of difference, except it did. <laughs> and um, folk are saying, oh, is it psychosomatic? And I'm saying, well, no, well, I've got quite a strong mind. And I, um, I was thinking, this ain't going to work. <laughs> Not that it would. I was thinking it wouldn't. But it did. And so I'm thinking, okay, well, well, power to you. That's actually another thing that I can look at and say, right, that's a, that's a winner. Yep, Absolutely. I've got Jack on the line now waiting to speak next, Paul. So thank you for calling in this morning. And next week we'll be back to our usual time. Okay. Take care. Bye for now.
Good morning, Jack. Welcome to Cam's Buddies at Breakfast. Good morning, Cam. How are you? Yeah, I'm fantastic. You know, got up a little bit early to to do this show, but you know, needs must. We've got to all pull together sometimes. How many coffees have you had? Oh, I don't drink coffee. I don't like hot drinks. But bottles of Coke, oh. it's a different matter. Oh, okay. So uh, you would have seen on Monday, um, Christopher Luxon and Shane Reedy announced that they were appointing a commissioner to Health New Zealand, sacking the board or what was left of them because. They're spending $130 million a month more than their budget and are looking at a $1.4 billion deficit at the end of the financial year. Your thoughts on that? Well, it's frightening, isn't it? And this bloke they've appointed, and he's got a good track record, so they're doing the right thing. I've had a personal experience of how bad the Auckland hospital system is. And I can tell you, it's not good. Well, I, I can't complain about the treatment that I've had um, at the hospitals when I had my stroke and things like that, but that's rather acute and you know they actually all rush to do okay. things. But I do know that there are numerous people that have had poor outcomes as a result of understaffing or, um, you know, just poor diagnosis or a whole number of other things um, that have happened. And I, we do definitely need to do something about our health system and I think you're right, it's a good start having someone as competent as Lester Levy uh, into that position so that he can start getting a grip on actually trying to make the health system the best it can be. I agree. Well, all of the uh, nurses want to do is go on strike. Now, um, I know a doctor who works at Waikato Hospital and he's furious at the lack of work ethic amongst the nurses. He's absolutely furious. He said they do the least amount possible. Obviously, that doesn't apply to all of them, but um, it's sort of what my experience was. Well, I was in there, and I won't know what it was for, but anyway, I was stuck in this room, totally ignored. But I happened to be right opposite where the nurses' sort of desks were. And I listened for two hours. It was over two hours, actually. This nurse did nothing but talk to her boyfriend about what she was going to do on holiday, which was quite <laughs> enlightening. I thought I knew this uh, girl inside and out at the end of it, but not once did she glance my way or come over and say, hey, can I do anything for you? And I thought, oh, That's because you're too polite, Jack, because whenever I've been in hospital, I've viewed um, uh, the way that I interact with hospital staff. I'm not demanding or overbearing, but I'm certainly an advocate for my own health, and, uh, and I'm not yep. afraid to speak up. And if you just sit there and wait for them to come and do something, they won't. No, it seems not. I mean, you have, I've, I had good experiences in there and real bad experiences. I nearly died as a result of some middle-aged doctor who told me, no, I couldn't possibly um, be having um, a gallstone problem if I had pains in my chest and um, discharged me. Cost me ten thousand dollars to get John Dunn to take a three centimetre um, gallstone out, you know, just a short while later, and he said he nearly died. And when I read on the internet, as you do, you go to Google and say, "What are the symptoms of, um, you know, chest pains, heart attack, whatever?" And they say, "Number one, number one on the list was could be confused with a gallstone." And I thought, "What the hell?" Oh well, there you go. See, that's the the experience I've had with specialists at hospital you know after i had my stroke i had this eminent neurosurgeon come in and give you know they gave me some tests for you know three or four hours and he came in and had a whole bevy, bevy of people around and then he told me in very stern terms that it was a very serious stroke that i'd had and that the prognosis for recovery was not good um and that you were never going to use i was never going to use my right arm again and I said to him, well, what does that mean? And he said, well, you're going to have to learn to write with your left hand. Because I have no confidence in anything he says after that because I'm left-handed. And he didn't know that, even though they asked you <laughs> four or five times, uh, you know, during the day, are you left or right-handed? They ask you over and over. You get sick of answering it. right? So, but he didn't yeah. even read the notes. And here he was telling me I was going to have to learn to write with my left hand. Well, I got that nailed. And then I then I got... Um, the recovery in my right hand nailed as well. So, 
you know, I don't have a lot of confidence in professionals who have specialised so highly in one particular area. They, they, they're just not open to the idea that uh, people can uh, recover from things uh, if only you'll give them a chance. Many of them seem to be enamoured by their own wonderfulness. That's only a few of them. There are some good ones, of course. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I can't speak highly enough about um, two of my GPs um, that I had considerable interaction with, uh, very compassionate doctors, and actually solved the problems. But but uh, it's like school teachers; they're few and far between. You know, a good school teacher is few and far between. The rest of them are, you know, it's just dross usually. Well, it's the same in the medical profession. There's really really good surgeons uh, and specialists, um, but they're few and far between. The rest of them are also rand. My GP in Parnell, Richard, that saved my life at least twice in the last 40 years. Um, but once you've got a good GP, man, you have to stay with them. Yeah, well, one of my GPs retired, and I was really annoyed about that. And when I saw his replacement, I said, well, we're going to start on the training program now because um, I need to train you up to the level I had the last GP. And she got all upset about that. And I said, well, fit in or I'll get another one. But she's coming along nicely. Yeah, well, you're only a young fella. <laughs> exactly. I, I, I've outlasted at least four or five previous GPs until my current one, and I was the very first patient that I've been my GP for 40 years, 42 oh, years. Oh, dear Lord. It's like Dad. He's outlived uh, all the GPs that um, he's had, and now he's got another one. Yeah, I have to keep saying to him, please don't retire. I'm sick of finding new doctors. Yeah, new doctors that do what you want. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But anyway, um, let's believe he's a good bloke, I believe. I we'll think so. Out. I mean, he runs an engineering firm, so you should like that. What sort of engineering? Tonkin and Taylor. Oh, does he? The, I didn't realise that. He's a medical doctor and a qualified surgeon, and he's also the chairman of an engineering and environmental firm, Tonkin and Taylor. He's got the skills. He's got the skills. He's a superman. He is. And he will fix it if anyone can. Yeah, maybe we have to call him Lester the, I don't know, it doesn't rhyme. I, I can't work that one out. Bob the Builder worked, but, you know, Lester's going to fix it. Anyway, I don't know what your uh, specialist was uh, saying about you, because um, when I spot you, you show no indications to me of ever having a stroke. Well, that's that's because I, is a case of mind over matter. I didn't mind and he didn't matter. <laughs> All right, Jack, thanks oh, for coming in this morning, yeah. and we'll talk again next week, and it'll be in the afternoon. Okay. Thanks, See Jack. See you again, and stop getting up so early. I hate it. <laughs> yeah. Bye. Bye. Good morning, Jimmy. Welcome to Cam's Buddies at breakfast. G'day, Cam. This is a bit early, isn't it? Well, you know, we've got, right. to, we've got to help Paul. He's he's busily, busily moving his household and family down to Queenstown, so... We all chipped in and filled in for him, and uh, I I drew the Thursday slot being my normal day for the show. We just did it at breakfast instead of uh, at four o'clock. Oh well, you've got the rest of the day free, oh mate. Now, what's your subject this week? There's plenty on board, plenty on uh, offer. Well, everyone else is talking about U.S. politics, but I thought I'd get the buddies to talk about uh, the health system in New Zealand and the necessity for the government to appoint a commissioner to Health New Zealand because they're spending something like $130 million a month more than their budget and are projected to lose $1.4 billion for the financial year. Well, it's just another massive cluster from Chris Hipkins, isn't it? It's an omni It's just not surprising. Who, who was the last Minister of Health in the previous? Andrew Little and Aisha Verrill. Oh, yeah, then yeah, I mean, everything Labor did, the centralisation of everything. So this this happening is just not surprising, and there'll be more to come, more departments. It, the government is just giant and inefficient and poorly run. It's not like the health department doesn't have enough money. They have about $6,000 for every Kiwi. The, uh, the, Labor, of money. the Labor ministers have the reverse Midas touch, a, a literal poop. <laughs> A literal poo finger in everything that they touch turned to poo. Well, they just got no idea. They just want to make the bureaucracy massive but not actually deliver the product. It just I heard on the radio that there was 14 layers of bureaucracy in some parts. It's insane. 
14 layers of you bureaucracy, know, what, what, two and a half thousand more bureaucrats in the health system rather than doctors and nurses and specialists. And they cost heaps to run. So the money's going to pay these just sit and have meetings all day and make decisions, and but they're not actually helping patients at the front end. It's, it's just no private company would act like this. It's just the government. And it's everything Labour stands for is giant government, inefficient meetings, bureaucracy. It's just and, it's mind blowing, and, and, and they all do it. Like look, look, and how, an astonishing waste of money. Oh, it's 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 truly mind blowing how much money. You know, look at the government as a whole, how much it was you know spending. You know, look at the state of our economy. Queenstown shops down a third of turnover, a third down. Yeah, and, how can people survive? The is down sixty five percent. Yeah, I mean, how can we survive? I mean, I'm hearing of sawmills empty, not no 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 wood going through at all, none. You know, like a staggering. I would say New Zealand's in a heading for a depression, eh? You know. Well, that's the thing. That's 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 just that's bad news everywhere. The politicians don't seem to know what's going on in, in, out in the street, and neither do, do, do people unless they're directly affected because they always go, oh, we should be spending this on the health system, we should be spending that, and you say, well, where does that money come from? Oh, the government. Well, it doesn't come from the government. It comes from our back pockets. Productive people. And, and we've got these troughers in the health system that have been enriching themselves uh, and not delivering better outcomes in health. I mean, they have... They have a, a policy in Health New Zealand that um, every meeting starts with a karakia. You know, if you try to say, I want every meeting to start with a, with a Muslim prayer or a Christian prayer, there'd be howls of outrage. Uh, but because you say it's a karakia, I know no one's allowed to speak out about that. I know. Isn't government supposed to be secular? Well, that's exactly right. But we've got this adherence to Maori mythology that, you know, that there's a, a god for the sky and a god for the earth and a god for the forest oh, and a god for the ocean. And then, and the Te Ao Maori um, health outcomes will be improved if we, you know, just followed Maori science and um, and Maori uh, health. Well, how did that work for just, the, before we got here? It's just more woke mind virus crap, mate, and it's not helping us. Imagine the government's tax take next year because the economy is terrible. No one's going to be making much profit. Imagine the, the difference between the government spending and the, the t- tax income next year. It's going to be massive. It's going to be harder to balance the books. No, oh, absolutely. It will be. And no one's talking about it. We, oh, to be honest, I've had so many people complaining to me in the last sort of week or two just about the state of their businesses or they're laying off staff or they've got no work. Like literally no work, and I'm just I just worry about it. And that bloody Maori karaoke at the start of a meeting. It's just pathetic. Mm. We can't go on like this. Right, so well, the, the health system is just another system of labour, mate. They tried to centralise it, made it too big, made it giant bureaucracy, and it's just a terrible outcome. And hopefully, it can be fixed before everyone leaves to Australia. Well, I think so. Mr. Levy's the guy to do it. He's got you know, good credentials. He is actually a doctor and, and a surgeon. He's been the chair of the White Amata Health Board, the Auckland Health Board, uh, and he's fixed up several other organisations along the way. So, um, you know, it's interesting uh, that he's been chosen to do that. Uh, hopefully he will be able to uh, fix it. And if any if anybody can, it's yeah. him. Well, that's good because I see on X that the most – wokest people hate him, so that means he must be effective. So I wish him all the best. I mean, we need to turn the country around. I've never, ever seen it in a state like it is, actually, on, on all fronts. So, yeah. Oh, totally. Anyway, Jimmy, I better let you go. I um, mean, go off and catch a uh, coffee uh, now um, to wake yourself up, and uh, we'll be <laughs> at normal time next week. Thanks for calling. Okay. Thanks, Kev. Have a great day. Cheers. It's always interesting to see what the person on the street thinks about these sorts of announcements, and today was no different. Tell us your thoughts on Cam's Buddies by emailing inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. Thanks for tuning in to RCR, Reality Check Radio. Do you like what you're listening to or dislike what you're listening to? Either way, we want to hear from you. 
Get in touch with us now. You can text us with your message to 2057. That's 2057. Or email us at inbox at realitycheck.radio. We'd love to hear from you, so connect with us today.